Chapter 5 Fancy another one? Fancy another one? What? I said. Do you want another pill? Oh, go on then. I can't remember ever saying no. I was surprised that I had managed to string a coherent sentence together, and even more surprised that Gary could undo the tight, sweated knot he had put into his bag of ecstasy tablets. Cheers, Gag. Nice one. I swallowed it down without looking at it with a bottle of tepid beer, slightly gipping as it frothed up in the back of my throat. I burped out my observation. Fucking hell, these New Yorkers are berserk, mate. I know, I've had five of the fuckers and can't feel me feet. What? My feet? I said I can't feel me feet. Oh, right, nice one. Have you seen Turney in here? It was difficult to hear what anyone was saying. That may be why all the hugging started in the first place. Because the music was so loud, everybody turned primeval in their attempts to communicate. A huge cheer went up through the dry ice and the warehouse began to pump to the beat of Joe Smooth and Promised Land. Another Friday night in London had seen four carloads of us head for King's Cross to a disused warehouse. The night was called Ibiza 2000 AD and for the several months it ran it was not far behind Manchester's Hacienda as the best night out on the pills. The year was 1989. The Ibiza at King's Cross could have been moody, but it wasn't. It was filled with the right calibre of people. It was the uncharted early days in the warehouse scene, and the nights were magical to all those that can remember them. I must admit, I was not really into the music as much as some other lads. I would recognise the odd favourite tune, but could not tell you who had sung it. I liked the crack, the bonding on a new front and the travelling to other parts of the country, still as a crew, but on a different agenda. Even so, standards were always to be kept up, even if your jaw had gone across your face. You were still Stoke City M40, and you were still on show. We always remained cool and kept that aura about us. That never changed. It was the same across the country. Mostly, it was the football firms who were organising the parties in their own areas. They were the ones setting the standards, and they were the ones who were making all the money. West Ham and Pompey were very lively during the party era, and always at the bashes. You could hear the Portsmouth crew through the smoke as they danced and sang, Mental! 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 in their unmistakable Pompey accents. West Ham usually just observed. Like me, the ICF were not dancers. One thing that I found difficult throughout that rave period was the occasional introduction to a member of another firm who was off his face and pretending to be your old mate's new best friend. Jasp, Jasp, this is Danny. Danny, Jasper. Danny's Millwall, mate. Yeah? So why the fuck have you brought the fella over to speak to me, then? You know I fucking ain't Millwall. All right, Danny. How are you? I always made an effort, mostly because I didn't want to embarrass someone I loved. But it would normally be my cue to go and administer some first aid to one of our lot who had started to hyperventilate or something. I just could not see where all this newfound friendship was coming from or going to. It galled me. Most of the football lads fell as casualties to the happy pills, but I was not one of them. Stoke had got Bradford away tomorrow, and I was in the van, regardless of how fucked I was feeling. I was going to travel to another part of the country once again. Only this time, we were back to the main agenda. Football violence. Out of the entire late 80s firm of hundreds of lads, there were only really 15 of us who got heavily involved in the drug and dance scene. The rest were on the way, but not for a couple of years yet. We, the druggies of the firm, were mostly from Old Sager and had all grown up together. 
Those hedonistic and mind-threatening years were ones of sheer overindulgence and lack of self-control. If you looked at the dance scene through the spectacles of a pill-popping hoolie, one of the main fixtures of the calendar year would definitely be the closing night at the Club Amnesia on Ibiza. Word had it that all the main party heads from all over the country were flying over to the island to be at this event. Boy George was even using it to celebrate his birthday. Tickets were like gold dust, and for us dozen stoke lads at least, it would be like getting to Wembley and not being able to see the match if we couldn't get in. Undeterred, we headed to the island a week before the event, all determined that one way or another, we would be at that gig. Twelve of us were ferried in Gwilty's furniture van to Manchester Airport. En route, we took a couple of pills each to celebrate and stashed the rest inside our persons. Two weeks to go, twelve of us partying. That's about five pills a night each, plus some spares to use as currency. The lads had about a thousand pills with them, several ounces of high-grade pollen and a mountain of cocaine. You know, better be prepared, just in case you can't find a drug dealer nearby. In these circumstances, you've got to learn from your past experiences to prevent disappointments. We arrived in Ibiza on schedule and checked into our five-star apartments in Playa del Bossa. The accommodation was tasteful and we immediately paired off for our rooms. I was with my old mate and attention-seeking partner, Banff, alias Nobby Oatcake. He was one of the stronger personalities in the group, and perhaps, as I was renowned for army tricks, like shitting in people's beds, the only one brave enough to share with me. Neither of us knew, on that first night, that in fourteen days' time, Banff would be instrumental in preventing me from slipping into a drug-induced coma. I still think to this day that I owe him my life. Royston had been right about the difference between Ibiza town and the resort of San Antonio. It was a stark contrast in people and atmosphere. Ibiza town was old and rustic, San Antonio full of lager louts. Most of the lads I was with were quite cultured and enjoyed restaurants on the ambience of Spanish street life. Ibiza town was where we headed most nights before hitting a designated club somewhere on the island. It was authentic, the people relaxed and the cocaine we had was dynamite. We settled in nicely over the next several days, making Pasha our HQ in case of emergency and space if it was after five in the morning. All the logistics were in place, which was essential considering the states we were about to get ourselves into. Each day was as sweltering as the last, and we ploughed through them at speed, drinking a little water, but mostly beer and locally produced spirits. Several of us would get up in the late afternoon and head over to the other side of the island to watch the sunset and the beautiful women viewing it at Café Del Mar. The potheads amongst us enjoyed Del Mar, where we would have a cheeky pill, usually on the strength of the sunset and how good it was to be alive. Peace, man. The others would just be getting ready at about nine o'clock when we arrived back in our hired black seats. We'd congregate in one room, usually gags, where we would have a couple of hours of listening to tunes, drinking, snorting and smoking dope. At midnight, we all popped our first pills in unison and headed out to the bars. The night would probably take in two or three clubs, usually finishing off at space at around about 10am. If you had pulled, then bully for you. If you hadn't, it was back to gags to smoke a couple of bongs and neck some to mazipan, before climbing into your own chariot for a quick pull over the girl with the dancing eyes that you were sure fancied you until that flash Italian cunt pulled up in his Porsche and whisked her away. Hope she's there again tonight. I won't get in such of a mess this time. And that cunt, he can have it as well if he wants it. Every night we tried and failed to score some tickets for amnesia. 
They were proving hard to find. Finally, it was just a night away, and still eight of us were ticketless. The lucky ones had either paid several hundred pounds or risked life and limb in daring snatch and grab raids on street touts. I was one of those without a ticket, so I decided it would be a good idea to go and have a recce at the club to see if there were any weaknesses in their security that could be exploited. There was one. It looked a bit precarious, but it was definitely worth a go. Gag and I were going to attempt to get into amnesia by climbing a nearby tree with branches that spanned over a courtyard inside the club. As long as they could hold our weight, I reckoned we were in. The ever hopeful Gag agreed. This was the event of the year, and all present that night added to an immense atmosphere of anticipation. Even people with tickets, who queued outside in large numbers, looked nervous until actually breaching the security at the main doors. The security men were big Spanish weightlifters. They were tooled up and looked horrible, dressed in tight black t-shirts and tight black pants. They were in charge, and you could tell they enjoyed it. Speaking little to anyone, male or female, they mostly used hand gestures. You were in, or you weren't. There was no discussion. Beautiful girls pulled sad faces, others chose seduction, but all to no avail. Friends and relatives of the DJs were told that with no passes they stayed outside on the street to wait in hope that their message reached its destination. It was strict, and people were becoming anxious. With anxious people on drugs, an atmosphere can change in seconds. Gag and I chose our moment to push through the queue and start our ascent of the tree. I just hoped and prayed that the people below us let us get on with it without kicking up a stink and getting us caught. It was weird trying to climb a tree while rushing from a pill. I chose a fine time to suffer from vertigo, but all of a sudden, I began to get clammy and my head started to spin. I could do nothing but cling on to the branch that I was halfway along. What a prat I must have looked. The sight that brought me to my senses had to be a football one. Just when I needed some sanity, it appeared right below me on the road outside the club. Five open top jeeps pulled up in a line. Their heavy engines remained running. I knew straight away, so did Gag. Anyone who came from our background would have known immediately that the firm of men and women exiting the vehicles and heading straight to the front of that desperate queue were the unmistakable ICF. Few people in the queue questioned the gate crashes. The security, though, spoke in frantic Spanish into their mouthpieces and horridly put a chain across the entrance. I was halfway across my branch by now, almost directly above the club's reception. A few more yards and I'd be on the roof and in. I heard every word of what was said next, and I've recited it a thousand times. As the West Ham firm crowded into the reception, one of them took control of the situation, while one of his Spanish counterparts took control of theirs. They got a massive no-chance from the head doorman. He was adamant, and almost looked as if he was going to pull his pistol at one stage. I thought from my perch above that I was about to see a mental row. That was until the tall, curly-haired Cockney leaned towards the Spaniard and said bluntly, Listen to me, you cunt. If you don't invite us to your party, you ain't fucking having one, all right? They didn't wait for an answer. A crowd of twenty or so cockneys breezed straight in. What a fucking entrance. You've got to give it to them. That was my cue. Amid the confusion, I slipped over the roof and into the courtyard in the middle of amnesia. What a blinding result. Let's have another pill. It was an immense rush getting in. My immediate thought was to get my bearings and to find any of the lads who may have already made it in. I strolled casually around a sizable, stylish courtyard which had the feel of a Mexican hacienda, like the one on the high chaparral. 
The people who stood or sat around it were mostly continental and all attractive. It was proper, and that was probably the reason why people like me, undesirable scallies, had to find their own way of getting into it. I ordered myself a drink and sat, model-like, at the side of an ornamental fountain. I was looking good, I could tell. People, mostly women, were acknowledging me. Hello. I'd smile. It was a clear night, just coming dark. I could see the plough followed by the North Star. I raised my glass and winked towards the North and Stoke and all who lived there. Something I often do, no matter where I am in the world. I'd chosen a good place to sit and wait. Within an hour, most of us were together, laughing at each other's stories of how we'd managed to blag it into one of the top nights in the world. We drank champagne and sniffed cocaine. We popped pills and we rocked with the rest of the place. It was amazing. I opened my eyes after a mad moment of pure inner body rushes and saw all of my friends laughing and smiling like I had never seen before. Interacting with total strangers and not mentioning football violence and the off. Everything was over enhanced, at other times slightly muted and robotic. Strobe lights, sweating people asking unanswerable questions, waiters swaying in and out with trays of fluorescent liquids carrying bundles of rolled up pesetas and never forgetting to come back and serve you. And the beak gets stronger, and you get hotter, and she looks hornier than she did ten minutes before. Fuck, I'd give her one. Jasper, mate, can I have a word of men? Witty was off his crust. He turned a worrying shade of grey and stood sweating profusely next to me in his best night trainers, holding a glass of Jack Daniels in one hand and a Coke spliff in the other. He looked determined to string out his words, so I thought I'd better listen. Jasp, that bird that you keep staring at over there is a bit dodgy, mate. This was one of those e-moments where two intense heads get embroiled in a fast-moving conversation about fuck all other than the girl that I apparently keep staring at is with the ICF. All right, Mick, I'm with you, mate. Cheers. Most other hooligans in my situation right now would make an excuse and move away. I understood the threat, but decided to stay where I was. Besides, it was she who kept staring at me, and she was just how I like them. Stern and filthy looking. I was well chuffed with Wheaty's bit of vital information, and I did take heed. Around fifteen ICF were to my right, only about twenty people away, sat around the fountains. Circled around them was a two-people-wide gap. You didn't have to come from the hooligan world to appreciate serious danger when it was near you. They looked mean, they looked affluent, and they gave off an aura that said, Listen, forget it, we are here to relax, party and enjoy yourselves. Just don't involve yourself with us and everything will be right. If we unnerve you, tough. If we don't, fine. That's up to you. I had a little chuckle as I recognised a couple of them, in particular D, as the lads of a documentary called A Knocker's Tale that had been screened in the mid-80s. A fly-on-the-wall investigation which showed them door-to-door -door selling around the housing estates of East London. They used their flash charm on housewives and then travelled to the match in the van with the lads at the weekends, showing off all the dosh they had made. It looked to me that they'd done all right for themselves. I took another swig of vodka and cut my hands for Wally to skin up in. Observation over, I peered over my friend's shoulder to the other side of the fountains and winked at the dancing redhead with the stern seductive look who kept dangerous friends. A woman's cry in the distance hailed a new and soulful beat. The crowd were receptive, and excited appreciation greeted a guy called Gerald's Voodoo Ray. 
It was still dark in the skies above the club. A cool breeze lifted my senses, and I closed my eyes and went with it. The atmosphere was now reaching fever pitch. This was when every person at that venue was on the same massive rush of love and excitement all at once. It was pumping mad. Everyone looked about ready to explode into a frenzy of lust and happiness. She had planned her move precisely and executed it with pinpoint accuracy. My eyes were still closed when I felt her hands cup my face and my lips being pulled slowly and seductively down onto hers. I opened my eyes and looked into the face of the redhead. She smiled at me and said, Hello, you're a right cute northerner, ain't ya? She was Maria, and Witty was right. She was with the ICF. She was also spellbindingly gorgeous, and I had no qualms at all when she invited me over to a group for a drink. West Ham may well have had that presence about them, but so did we. And as always, our lads were networking the top tables where all of the most stunning women congregated around the obvious wealth and fame. Before long, Royston was serving a quartet of Boy George's entourage with pills. They were completely off it already, but still cleaned Roy out of his last 30 New Yorkers. And that was in the days when each E was more than a score. Roy declined the offer of a relaxed drink back on George's boat. He liked the song Karma Chameleon, because he could change the lyrics and sing to the away fans, Karma, 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 karma in the booth and end, as he gesticulated to them. But he'd rather run the gauntlet with me and the ICF than be stranded on a boat with George and his swashbuckling crew off their heads on the love drug. Gulp. Uh, no thanks, I've got to be up in the morning because we're going to Aquaworld for the day. Every football firm, I'm sure has an eccentric or nutty bird that hangs around with them. Stoke have had several over the years, and Maria was, I presume, West Ham's. I could tell that they all quietly kept an eye on her, and she was more than comfortable in conversation with them. I reviewed my situation. Here I am on the best night of the year in the hippest club on Ibiza. I've bunked in for nothing. I'm off my chunk on ecstasy and cocaine mixed with numerous beers and spirits. My mates are serving up the celebrities and I'm stood with a hell of a tasty woman who put me right in the middle of some of West Ham's top boys. Terrific. Whoa, is that Dougie and Maggot talking to Phil Collins or am I in a bad way? It was Phil Collins and he looked to be enjoying his huddled conversation with several members of a hooligan firm. There really were no boundaries in those ecstatic liberal mindsets of the e-pioneers. Everybody wanted to listen to each other and spread the word. Can you feel it? As the first tiny rays of the sun appeared over the shadowed mountains, the club turned briefly sombre. A new remix was being played. I'd heard it once before, at King's Cross, but this morning... It had a new meaning, as we were actually in his company. It was Phil Collins's In the Air Tonight, and Amnesia went absolutely ballistic. I was pulled into the fountains by dozens of loved-up ladies. Had it been a bloke that had pulled me into knee-deep water for a jig, especially as I don't dance, I would have thrown a punch. But it was mostly sex-crazed, scantily-dressed model-type women. So I decided to become a part of dance history instead of making it with an unsightly punch-up. I did not speak to Phil Collins, but apparently he was a really nice fella. When questioned about how he felt about having his song played in such a way at the reception it had received, he seemed pleased and took the opportunity to talk about the song and the meaning of the lyrics. I was intrigued to find out that it had a hint of revenge to it and a deeper meaning than I first thought. According to my friend, who sat most of the night with the music heads, Phil had written this song when he was at university pre-Genesis. One particular winter, the River Thames froze over. Phil and several close friends, all fellow students, headed onto the ice to lark around. Unfortunately, 
In one area, the ice was unable to hold the weight of one of his friends. It broke, and he crashed through into the bitterly cold water. The rest of them managed to scramble their way to the banks and safety, but the victim couldn't swim, and neither could all bar one of the others. It was down to one man to go into the Thames and save his drowning friend. He froze in a different way, and they all had to endure the agony of watching a friend die. It was obviously a pain which he had carried around with him ever since. By all accounts, he carried the memory for many years, until at a Wembley concert in 1981, he revealed his new song live and shamed his old friend in the meantime. I pondered a while on hearing that story. It moved me. Maria said goodbye and headed off with the rest of her crew. It was seven in the morning and all the beautiful people looked haggard and pale now. She told me that tonight was her last night on the island and that I, along with my friends, were invited to their villa for a last mad party before home. I said I would be there even if I was on my own. Most of the lads were of the same opinion that afternoon. Fuck it, Jasp. I wouldn't bother going there, mate. Gag was up for it, though. He could see I was after a bit of romance, but agreed with the lads that it could get precarious when away from the public domain, and he was not about to let me go alone. I thought quietly, Fucking hell. How often do you get the chance to go to some big tidy villa for a backstage party with the intercity firm? I surmised that from all the glimpses I'd had of West Ham over the years, be it with England or on the domestic front, they were always all right with Stoke. Always. It was on that basis that later that night, Gag and I got a cab to the other side of the island and attended the party. I was more excited to be at this party than I was at Amnesia the night before. It was held in the secluded grounds of a villa, some way from the coast, set in the foothills of a mountain. Electronic gates, winding drive, a huge open-fronted place with tennis courts and a floodlit pool. It was around the pool where the music was set up. The smell of food floated from the house. It was civilised enough, and our first thoughts were cool. We were told by an older fellow wearing a Billy Bunter-style cricket cap who was chilling with a beer on a swing chair that Maria was in the kitchen. I liked that, as obviously she had discussed our being there beforehand. We went in. She was made up to see us and immediately opened a bottle of bubbly. Gag lit a spliff and passed it around. Any worries we may have had so far were unfounded. I mingled and chatted. We were both made to feel extremely welcome. The party was spot on, with just the right amount and mix of people. It went on into the early hours until abruptly the serenity was smashed by a piercing scream from one of the bedrooms. Immediately, the music went off and the lights came on. The ICF were not the friendly hosts anymore. The temperature plummeted to nine below zero, and other guests started to look nervous. Gag and I moved closer together and stood and listened intently as the accusations flew. A couple of black kids, who both Gag and I thought were Arsenal gooners, seemed to be the focal point of a woman's accusations. She announced that the two of them had been inside her room and emptied it of a large sum of cash and some jewellery. That did not sound good at all. The party had come to an abrupt end. It was one of those icy moments that had got fuck all to do with you, but you were stuck in the middle of anyway. Maria appeared by my side and gave me a note with a phone number. She told us that the party was over. We thanked her for the invite and left the premises. As we turned at the edge of the drive, I could hear raised voices, mostly the black kids pleading their innocence. They may well have let us go, because they did not want us to witness something that had nothing to do with us. It was painfully obvious that it was going to turn very ugly. 
The ICF allowed Gag and me to leave that crime scene without even a mention of a search, although we had both been inside the villa several times. I saw that as a massive mark of respect towards us. When we met up with the lads later that night in space and told them what had gone on, they agreed. I actually did see Marie again, quite soon afterwards. We were at a rave in King's Cross when, quite surprisingly, it kicked off between a group of black girls and a group of white girls. It ended with a big black girl brawling in a vicious one-to-one -one with who else but Maria. After that night, I think Ibiza 2000 AD closed down. It was starting to get moody at the raves now. Lots of money was being made by people who were vulnerable and easy to lean on. Street life was finding the new drug life and bringing some of its old habits with it. I wasn't bothered, though. The seedier it got, the more I loved it. Esparadis, a venue in San Antonio that filled up with water and bubbles at the end of the evening, was the club we chose to get in our last mess together. We started on it early, straight after the sunset at nearby Del Mar. We parked our three Seats and became boozy Brits abroad for several hours until the clubs got going. The last dance was always going to be messy. We each knew that, and with no intention of taking any pills back to England, we were all going to be on five or six numbers each. It doesn't sound a lot, but on top of everything else we had used to poison our bodies, it might just be enough to push one of us over the edge. The night was rocking and Esparadis was rammed to the rafters with Scandinavian women and mad clubbers. West Ham were also there, just the lads, and they had a few new arrivals with them. They looked moodier tonight, but still kept to themselves. We had a new arrival with us too. Animal had arrived from Amsterdam on his motorbike with our friend from Leeds. They had ridden a couple of racing bikes over which had both been packed with ease, just like Hopper and Fonda in Easy Rider. Animal surprised none of us when he also proclaimed that he had 1,000 acid tabs on him. Smiley faces, he said. Turney chuckled to me devilishly. Are we having one, Jay? I declined. I was already wishing the night was over. It had been a gruelling session and it was starting to weigh heavy with me. Half an hour later was the turning point in the evening for me. Turney and Worley were in raptures as they pulled me along. Jay, come and have a look at Gary. Gag was stood in the mist like a centurion, alone between two Roman pillars. He wore red kickers with faded baggy jeans. His long sleeved t shirt was in bright green and had chippy embroidered across it. He was motionless, his hands clasped before him. His eyes remained tightly closed, yet he looked up to the heavens with the biggest smiley face any of us had ever seen. Gag looked like he was in heaven. Fuck it, where's Animal? Like fools, we all had to indulge. Taking acid and then driving was not a good idea at all, but we had no choice. The cars had to be handed back to the rental company before nine that morning, plus we had to vacate the apartments by eleven. We set off back to Playa Dambossa in a three-car convoy. I was in the lead vehicle, being driven by a tripped-out tourney. It was 5.30am and already the sun was up and at us. Like vampires, we craved the darkened sanctuary of Gag's apartment. We had well over an ounce of pollen to polish off yet. Turney put his foot down and blasted up the music. Like we needed that. I could see the onion seller on his push bike. Even Bamf and Wally could see him from in the back. I saw him from more than 500 yards away, clear as day. Turney later said, I should have told him that at the time. 
I just saw the bike rider's petrified expression as he pedalled like a man possessed to avoid his deliverance to evil. All three panic-stricken passengers screamed at the driver at once. It was too late. Crack. The cyclist was fortunately shunted up in the air instead of being crushed below the wheels, which kind of softened the shocked stomach blow I felt immediately. He let go of his handlebars in mid-flight and was a good three feet in the air as he watched his departing bicycle land in a ditch several yards away. We all turned and looked at the shocked expressions of our friends' faces in the cars behind us. All mortified, except for Gag, who still had a huge smile on his face and his eyes were tightly closed. The lads in the rear car said the bloke was definitely all right, because he was up on his feet again in seconds, gesticulating as they passed. His bike was a mess, though. I looked at Turney, who was driving on oblivious of all the fuss. What? he asked. His huge smile was innocently evil. I was tempted to suggest that he had really seen the cyclist and had driven over him in a moment of madness, but thought better of it. Instead, I offered to drive, but he refused to let go of the wheel. We were all more than a little relieved to be back in Gag's apartment, watching him put in the finishing touches to his bucket bong. We still had five hours before we had to vacate the rooms. When we had arrived back, Roy and Dougie were asleep in bed. They had failed to make it out the previous night, so were relatively fresh, and obviously had not participated in the acid trip. I sat at the bottom of Roy's bed, watching Gag at the table in front of me, lovingly loading his bong, his face still creased with laughter lines. Gag had always been known as the bong master general of our firm. He packed them with tons of weed and always had it so the hit was through a nice, matured brandy, which gave it that warmth. Now, while in familiar surroundings, the acid overwhelmingly started to kick in. Everyone found a comfy spot in the apartment and the party started. All leftover drugs, mostly cannabis and cocaine, were declared and thrown onto the table in front of Gag, who threw it all into the mix and rubbed his hands as he smiled appreciatively. He toked hard, filling his lungs to capacity. He turned blue before he exhaled, coughed and gipped before reloading. I gipped watching him, and I was next up for the bong. After a quick preliminary line of coke, I took a huge cannabis hit through brandy, which I held in to ingest before exhaling. It blew my head off. I softly sat back down on the foot of Roy's bed, then observed the debauchery at close quarters. Everyone was off his head, including Roy and Dougie, who had now started to participate in the mischief. After my second hit on Gag's bucket bong, I began to feel clammy. My conversation ceased. I felt out of it. Everyone else seemed to be okay and parted on at pace. That began to unnerve me a little. I had never lost it before although I had seen plenty who had, including people present. My confusion levels were rising, and I was sure I was about to lose the plot completely. I swallowed hard at the thought of the third hit of cocaine and weed, and it was my turn again. I smiled assuredly at Banff as I reached forward to take my turn on the big hitter. Gag lit it, and I toked hard until I was about to burst. I felt strange, but I wasn't about to start acting strange in front of my friends. I was involved with an inner struggle to remain steadfast and composed. Then boom. My head exploded again, and this time I fell back down into my spot on Roy's bed. Click. The snap of a camera. Worley had been taking pictures of our expressions as we came up from a bong explosion. My expression on that particular shot was lost and vacant, combined with illness and starvation. I looked a mess, but no picture could portray the harrowing experience 
I was about to endure. I could feel Roy's legs moving on the bed behind me, and I could see Banff and Gary chuckling between themselves at the table in front of me. All the lads were still sat round doing their thing, only I could not hear them. My head was filled with a dull, hollow tone, similar to the one you might hear in a hearing test. Only this tone was a little bit different. It sounded sinister and strangely human. I clasped my hands together on my knees and gulped for air. It was at this point that not only could I not hear anyone, I could no longer see anyone. Gone. Blank. All of a sudden, it was just me and my nightmares. My vision, for some reason, became focused on my hands down in front of me. They were cut together, and the hollow gap between my entwined thumbs and forefingers looked like a dark Toblerone-shaped tunnel that disappeared somewhere inside my hands. Aware of nothing except the tunnel in front of me, my mind pursued its intense train of thought deep into the particles of my epidermis. Everything was magnified to the point that I could actually see the pores of my skin breathing. The dark humming sound in my brain built in momentum as my fascination with the tunnel grew stronger. Now, inside the dark triangular mass, a yellow and black moving chessboard effect appeared. It grabbed my train of thought and pulled me in harder as the noise built again in intensity. Just as I stepped towards the chessboard that was heading down into the narrowness of the endless tunnel, I was showered in light from flames that burst into life all around the triangular entrance. I noticed hieroglyphics beneath the fire, which unnerved me even more. What is this tunnel? Where does it go? I was starting to fall inside it, and I didn't like it. Bump. According to Banff, my head just nodded forwards as if I was dozing in the car. He wasn't overly concerned, but he knew it wasn't like me, and he kept his eye on me for a minute. Meanwhile, I sat motionless, fighting the hardest battle of my entire life. Every last morsel of my energy from my stomach up was fighting to stop myself from going down that tunnel. It must have been the moment that Bamp saw my head drop, because against everything my mind was telling me about holding on, I fell over the edge. Plummeting at a great speed, the chestboard shapes were endless and went on and on, becoming thinner and thinner into the darkness. I was still fighting inside myself to stop and climb back out, but it was too late. I had no strength, and that dark humming was freaking me out, man. Who is it? What is it? How will I ever get back from this? Please, no, I don't want to die in here. Slap. Charlie, are you okay? My closest mates often call me Charlie, after Charlie Chester, the old-time comedian. Bamford hit me hard across my leg. The interaction catapulted me from deep within myself. I came out of that tunnel in a bolt-action standing movement up off the bed and screaming at the top of my voice in sheer terror and relief to be alive and out of that hell. Then I went into convulsions and started gasping for breath. Banff, in one movement, slid open the patio door and pulled me through it into the daylight. Everyone in the room sat tight. It was left entirely to Banff. There was no need to crowd and fuss. Another bomb was lit and another camera flash lit the room. You're okay, man. You've just had too much gear. Take it easy and drink some orange juice. How many times had I said that to some other poor sod? Banff was easy and relaxed, and for a brief moment I could acknowledge to myself that at least I was with someone who knew the score and I could trust. Assessment over. I became confused again, mostly as to where the hell my mind had gone inside that tunnel. The frightening thing was that Banff had not been there with me, so the experience was not shared and therefore could not be resolved jointly. I was on my own, 
and beginning to think that my mind was still inside the tunnel and had not come back out with me. I turned to Banff once again in an attempt to explain my anxiety when his face shattered in front of me. It cracked into a mosaic. From then on, everything I looked at, including buildings, cars, people, the sky, myself, all had a tiled effect. Now, I was starting to hate this. He decided that a brisk walk along the promenade would be the best idea. It would surely bring me round a bit. 9.30 in the morning, and it was already getting hot. People were about. Traffic rushed past, as did dogs and a cat. Or was that a rat? It moved so quickly. I was feeling all right now my legs were moving and blood was pumping. Good. Keep walking, mate. It'll sort you right out. This is just what we needed. Banff was doing his best, and it was working until ping. My mind flew across to the other side of the road, and I stood there in silence, watching myself and Banff as he walked alongside me, giving me reassurance. I looked fucking pathetic, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. I must have looked a proper cunt to those people with their families trying to cross the road next to me to get to the beach, babbling like a kid with another grown man next to me trying to coax me along. Whoosh! I was back staring at Banff's shattered complexion. Banff, I went over there. I went over there. Why did I go over there? I was now frantic, firm in my belief that I had lost part of my mind due to the tunnel incident. I wanted it back. I was not prepared to go on in life without it. I was hopelessly trying to explain all this to Banff as I hyperventilated and had a series of fits. Then... I started to run up and down the streets in blind panic, looking for what I thought I was missing. It was comically insane, but deadly serious. Banff started to hit me with questions that he knew were relevant to me in an attempt to occupy my mind and try to get me back a bit. Jasp, Jasp, listen to me, listen to me. He held my shoulders firmly. Who won the cup in 72, mate? Who won the cup in 72? We did. And which player broke your heart by signing for Manchester United? Jimmy Greenoff. Correct. And if you could live anywhere in the world you wanted to, where would it be? Corpus Christi. The Gulf Coast of Texas was my dream destination. It got me back. Quick-fire questions worked, but only for as long as Banff could keep it up. If he stopped asking me the questions, my mind pinged into another scenario of me looking on at myself in heartfelt despair. It was soul-destroying to me. Each time I went over there, Banff yelled, You're losing it! And my mind immediately returned home and continued to stare into his face once again. It was taking too long. He decided to take me back to the lads in the hope that they would be able to give him a hand. We arrived back at the apartments expecting to find everyone still sat round, casually smoking dope. On the contrary, it was like a scene from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and our arrival was about to make it all the more insane. I'm sure none of us, including Banff, had any conception of the time of day it was, but it had gone eleven, and on our return, the first thing we saw was a rather perturbed maid trying to converse in broken English with Worley. He was standing, rooted to the spot in the corridor of one of the apartments, wearing only a pair of yellow Bermuda shorts. His lips were blue. He was shaking uncontrollably and cradled an air horn to his chest, as would a mother with a child. He looked at the pair of us with a blank, open expression, as if he'd never seen either of us before in his life. As I approached him, he hugged his air horn tighter, as if I were about to take it away from him. It might sound cruel, but seeing Wally in such a pathetic state made me feel a whole lot better than I had done five minutes earlier. In our absence, Gag had completely demolished the rest of the lads with his bongs. The place stank of hash, and Dougie's panic was that any minute the manager, who had already been called by the impatient cleaners, would turn up with the police and we would all be carried off. He had a point. 
A handful of crumpled and sweaty currency bought us an extra hour to pack our things and clear off. In disgust, the management and maids left us to it, or should I say, to Dougie and Roy. All of us who had participated in Animal's Acid were totally smashed out of our brains. Roy and Doug sat us down in one room, then led two at a time to a pile of clothes and a selection of holdalls. Each item of clothing was then held up and shown, and on the strength of a nod, it would be packed away as luggage. This was a prolonged affair, as every item that was packed was then removed unseen by Gag and placed on another pile. Roy and Doug both said that if they had had their time again, they would have thrown everything in together and sorted it out when we got back home. Oh well, you live and learn. I sat alone on a chair in a long corridor between the bedrooms and the lounge, where everyone else was congregated in silence. I could see them all from where I was. Each dribbled childishly and rocked in motion and some even took to inspecting at length the patterns on the furniture. If I looked the other way, I could see Worley still standing silently, cradling his air horn as he stared inside the bedroom at whatever his trip was showing him. He looked terrified. Without Banff to coax me along, my mind started to go again. I asked Worley if he knew why it was that I went down that tunnel and why I kept going over there. His tiled expression was vacant and he made no attempt at speech. Oh my God, what has happened to us? This was a bunch of lads that partied hard every week all over the country, got in some real messes together and enjoyed every minute of it. This was the first time ever that we had all fed off each other in such a way that it had gone so badly for us. I was falling hard down that tunnel. No strength. There seemed no turning back from the blackness. Then, my mind was yanked back out by Banff's slap on my leg. He got me out of there. I was now positively convinced that I had been dying and going to hell for all my sins. It was my time. I remember conceding to the situation. I really had gone. I know that for a fact. I mean, what was at the end of that tunnel? Coma? Death? I don't know to this day. But that was where all my confusion of my trip was coming from. Was I in this awful state because Banff had pulled me back prematurely from death and in doing so left a piece of my mind behind, causing me to be in this nightmare world of tiled confusion? Fuck! I'm hot. I was mentally overloading again, feeling hot and uncomfortable. I chose to slide down off my seat and lie face down on the cold corridor floor. Oh no, not again. It's back. No, please, it's coming to take me away. I started to slither face down along the corridor, almost like an evolving sea creature reaching terra firma for the first time. Neither I nor Worley paid any attention to each other as I passed by his feet and slithered out of sight into the bathroom. I could not feel or use my legs, so I reached up with my arm and grabbed hold of the basin. Still convinced I was going to die, I also knew I needed water. With what strength I could muster, it took me several minutes to finally pull myself level with the taps. Using one hand to steady myself and the other to splash my face, I began to talk out loud in an incoherent panic. It's not working, is it? The water's not working. I really am fucked, aren't I? Oh, my God! Devastated, I mulled over my reflection in the mirror before me. Never had I seen such a face of death, my own dead face. I looked shattered, my eyes lifeless and set deeply in the back of my head. Beat up and forlorn, I slid back down onto the floor and proceeded to stare resignedly at my feet. It was over for me. I'd gone. I took no part in the packing of my belongings. That was done for me, and I spent the rest of the day lying on a sunbed in the shade with everyone else. 
Wheaty had eventually managed to get me to drink some orange juice and I started to come round a bit. There were still nine hours to wait before our flights, so we hung around the pool. Funnily enough, no one else did. It was a scorching day and not one other person would come anywhere near us. We must have looked a right state. We got home, and Gwilty kept his promise to bring us all a pill for our journey back to Stoke in his furniture van. Jasp, are you having this pill or what, mate? What sort is it? I don't know, but it's in a capsule. Looks all right. All right, then. Chuck us one over. Cheers. I don't mind a pill, especially if it's a clean one, but I'm not having that acid ever again. I never have. I did take ease for another three or four years, though probably up until the point when we'd all sit around at Brunty's flat from Friday until Monday with four or five others, demolish about 20 pills a day, and then complain in the taxi later on about having heart convulsions and not being able to see past your nose. I think it was at that point I gave up the ease and just made my tipple, the odd reefer, and my old advocate, Sir Charles himself. Most of us got through it. Sadly, some did not. But the e-culture and its deadly accompaniments tore us away from the mundane and choking society we came from. When we few lads from Stoke started going to the dance parties, the scene was in its infancy. Everybody who attended those bashes was in the know. It started with the London click and spread through a creative grapevine, attracting the country's most flamboyant people. It must be our fault then, the way it turned out. It was all fine and dandy when the first few football heads found that new platform to perform on. Perhaps we brought what is seedy about our culture with us. Perhaps we dragged it down. When I finally cleaned myself up in 1994, the drug culture I was rid of had finally turned sour. Ease were a quid apiece and normally manufactured locally. You were literally risking your own life on a pill and too many people around me were losing theirs. It didn't make sense. As for my thoughts on my experience in the tunnel, I owe Bamp for that one. I wasn't coming back and I'm glad he got me. I do think still that a part of my mind was lost somewhere that morning. I have suffered from black mood swings ever since. Regularly, I've opened conversations with myself and find it very difficult to play chess. You've got to have a laugh, though, haven't you?